right, is the state's next witness uh, outside, madam? Yes, sir. All right, okay. Our jurors present, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Madam. In terms of what, madam? Uh, the, um, the next witness image and um, if you're correct, I'm going to do this person to do that before the lab is done outside. Madam. All right, Miss Love, go ahead. Uh, you, Mr. Adams, and, and I don't think you can be heard. So could you repeat what you said, please? I, I ask that the court um, allow us to, um, allow us the consideration that we requested at the bench before we broke um, for at least the remainder of today until such time as the court can hear as it wishes from the witness themselves regarding the concern or until such time we just why, for today. Okay. Why we could, okay, this is again, why, we couldn't have taken this up at an earlier time or you couldn't let me know this so I could go ahead and rule upon it earlier? We're, Your Honor, um, my, I, with, I, with all due respect to you, Madam, and you, and you, your witness, you did ask, okay? But at this point in time, I'm inclined, no. I'm inclined not to, not to at this point. Um, Your Honor, would the court um, allow it to be heard from the witness? We should have heard that days ago. Has she been threatened, madam? As I explained at the bench, and I don't want to say a whole lot, but as I explained at the bench, because of the nature of um, the work that was done and because of the lack of the protection that carrying the shield would normally provide at this point, we were asking for that consideration that was given to a similar witness in her position who is still afforded the protection of the shield. So we asked for that reason because of the extent of the involvement that she had in particularly sensitive matters that she will go into today and that the court can hear before the court makes a decision about the rest of the week. We were asking for that small consideration for the next 30 minutes or however much time we'll be in here today. Madam. I am supposed to have a hearing on that. I am. You know that under Rule 22, I'm supposed to have a hearing on that issue. If, if, Your Honor, there's, if, there were, if there was a media person who was insisting on that, but there, Your Honor, there's just not, there's, they, we've talked things over with, with the media previously about other matters, and they don't have the objections that counsels for um, various and sundry defendants are leveling. They don't have those objections. So they are the ones with that ability and with that right with respect to Rule, two, um, rule 22. And they have not been leveling those objections. All so. Right. Anything further? No, we're just asking for that consideration. From the defendants, anything further? Counsels? Our name runs a caution, Mr. Matthews. Um, I certainly don't want to put anyone in the particular pos position of um, being um, targeted. targeted. And I believe that mm, this witness. for this particular witness, I believe that that is a grave concern given her involvement. So I'm gonna I'm gonna err on the side of caution over your objection. I'm gonna allow her. To not her face not to be shown, but she can be videoed. She can be audioed um, to that extent. All right. Thank you. All right. Summon your witness. Oh, oh, wait, 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 wait. One second. Can I do that? What is it, Mr. Steele? I'm sorry. Sir, um, I just wanted to perfect my objection to the Dalbert hearing not being held. I thought you did that at the bench. No, you, we took the break. He's not we. You no, I thought you did that before we took the break because you did say uh, about why you why why you objected and you asked me to have a Daubert hearing I told you that I that given the citation I was given um, and you cited to me Harris uh, in terms of why you know, in terms of your position 
Uh, it was the court's position taking a look at United States versus Ware that the Daubert hearing would, was not necessarily required, that the state still would have to prove the foundation as to, as to um, the requirements and admissibility in the court's gatekeeping function. And I'm sure that if they don't prove that, you will ask me to exclude that witness before you have an opportunity. Uh, and that, and you'll still have the ability to void out of that witness. Can I just simply put this on the record then? Understand yes, that. absolutely. But I wanted to let you know, that's what I heard at the bench. So what else did you, did you, did you did not tell me? Okay, so I think you know, I think you discussed, we discussed at the bench, it wasn't me, but um, there's no report that I have from the Okay, I, we took up that already as well. Just this one. Okay, and the report issue was that this witness does not have a report. I know that you've objected in the past that there should be a report. If a report winds up winds up being tendered, I will I will certainly uh, address that on the spot. Understood. And under your order of Harris versus State, you you put it in written order. In this case, you said that experts are, have to have a report. That's what the Supreme Court well, said. It's not mandated by the statute. But it's a better course, and we encourage that for our trial. Yes, and, and you have made that abundantly clear through the experts that have testified who did not have a report. Uh, so I've noted your objection, sir. Then that coupled with no CV until today with Detective Gaither. And that you have a CV now? Then you had the opportunity. When did you get it? Today. What time today did you get it? Well, last night. Are you sure that you didn't get it at some time during discovery? Was it tendered during discovery at any point in time on behalf of the state? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking. State, was it tendered at? I cannot say. Sorry, tell me what date it was tendered. And that's what we're trying to see. We're looking right now, Your Honor. Then it is a single page, and it is um, the document that they do have now. That's not the point. I know that I'm looking for the, what the court is asking for, and Your Honor, um, I'm, I'm looking at it. Was, it may have been. Um, may I make the two more points? She has your As she's thinking, yes. Just, just for uh, clarity. And then um, we are, as opposed to United States versus where, which was cited by the state, we are challenging qualifications and. Mm -hmm. Uh, reliability and helpfulness. And the reason I say that is because in where itself, um, this may not be an exact quote, but it's very close. Dalbert hearings may be helpful in complicated cases involving multiple experts. <coughs> Same section. Multiple experts, but go on. You have to also, it multiple scientific experts. Well, in this case, at multiple experts and we're going to have the blending potentially of a fact witness and an expert witness, and you already said we're not doing that. We have to have a demarcation. It's just a lot of, of information, and I don't really know. I don't know what the expert is going to do. That's in addition to and not cumulative of people you've qualified over objection. Detective Dennis, Detective Viverito, or Investigator Viverito, Detective Belknap who testified. And detective under So you know, at some point, to me, you should respectfully, we should hear why this is not cumulative. And that's what my objections are. And I appreciate you letting me make the record. You're welcome, sir. Not, not a problem. Madam, did you wish to be heard on that last issue, Mr. Steele? Um, Your Honor, I was just wanting to say that they we've not yet, the jury hasn't heard from anyone except um, Detective Belknap at this point. Um, and Detective Gaither, um, we'll, we will be clearly demarking and letting the court know at what point we would transition over into anything expert related. My anticipation was today we would not be the one to get to that, um, to that point. Um, so is the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, she is specifically here, in addition to giving her um, background, what her training and experience is, of course, she has to introduce herself to the jury, but um, we specifically are here to engage this witness regarding the Dexter Montgomery shooting, that um, she was one of the ultimate um, lead investigators on that case, was turned over to the gang unit, and she worked that case, and we are 
So is she a fact witness? She is. Yes, yeah, she for Dexter both. Montgomery. Yes, yeah, she. Yes, yeah, she is in fact a fact witness for Dexter Montgomery, and um, she will be tendered later on as an expert. So she's not test. So at this point in time, she is not. She is not. Um, we will not be eliciting expert testimony from her today. We will not even be tendering her as an expert today. Well, I still need to read the admonition, don't I? Um, I don't. I don't believe so. I think it's at the point where we stop and start getting into the different um, testimonies. Like when I stop with the fact uh, testimony and get into tendering her, asking the court to have her admitted as an expert. I think the point at which I ask that she be admitted as an expert is the point at which the court rightly gave um, the rightly give the demarcation admonition, if you will. Because everything that she's going to talk about, at least today, first, will be background and fact. Her background with games, um, just qualifications, but we will not be tendering her as an expert. But I, th I, I correct me if I'm wrong, though, but I believe that I did give the admonition before Detect Investigator Beltnap testified. I think Miss um, Hilton says that you did, um, but I think I'm not certain that I remember the exact circumstances, whether she started with the expert and then went into fact. I think she started with the expert and went into fact. I am going to start with fact, so she's just a regular witness, and until such time that the state asks that she be admitted as an expert, I do not believe it's necessary that the court even broach the subject with the jury. I think All right. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Sharp. I just want to remind the court of one other issue, just in case it comes up. <clears throat> I, I brought up the issue last week about, or actually on Monday, I believe, about uh, Investigator Robinson and the issue of an internal affairs investigation. And yes, I remember that. Ordered the state, and the state indicated that they may very well go into that, and you ordered the state to hand over all files that would be Brady material and hand them over to the, st hand them over to the defense. We have not received any of those files yet. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention in case the state starts getting into trying to get into some of those things that that we have not received anything as. Yet. That's with. Um... Investigator Gaither took over this investigation from that individual, I believe. So, yeah, do we do we have? Um, well, I, I said in Bentley, are you have you found or located the. Um... The internal affairs. We had asked for it. We didn't have it. And I believe that we did request and receive some documents okay. that we will be providing to the defense, but we won't be getting to that person at all at any point today either. So I would, it still needs to be turned over. So, Mr. Shard, you just remind me again, okay? All right. Anything further? Just for the uh, just the informed court, the fair court, we have motions outstanding here. I expect that to be done, uh, and you all should probably work that out. Um, I've seen plenty of conversations about it, but you all need to to, to gather your heads about it uh, in terms of whether or not. Because I thought I, I thought my instructions were pretty clear. We won't be bringing into any. Uh, we won't be bringing any of that before today is up. So I, I believe that. More... Miss Love, I'm gonna tell you. Before it comes up, you should have redacted that particular, that particular, you know, parts that the court has instructed you. If you have difficulties, then that should be put into put into writing, and I should hear about. I should be able to decide about that. But I believe I ruled upon all of the Murphy statements. They add more. They add more. That's all it is to it. Your Honor, there's an additional. I saw that. That there. Yeah, no, there's a conflict with what one of his attorney asked for. And so the state is confused. So Mr. Shard, in his motion, asked for a particular portion involving Mr. Murphy to be redacted. 
Now Mr. Steele is asking for it to be it. We, we took it out. We already did the proper. We already we sent over the redactions as ordered by the court. Mr. Steele, this morning when we talked after he reviewed, had some objections to what has already been redacted. And so we disagree. And so I don't think there's anything except for the court to hear those disagreements. Because at this point, we disagree on these additional redactions. But we have done them pursuant to what we've discussed last week, earlier this week. Those are redactions that have been already turned over. Hey, Your Honor, we don't, like I said, we, we won't be tendering those if the court will allow us to begin with the witness. And we can, if the court will allow us to further um, address those matters at the close of the, whenever the court sees fit today. I'd ask that the court allow us to do that outside of the jury being here. There was no, there's no need to, we will not be playing the video today of Walter Murphy. And I believe it's a matter that only the court can reconcile.
When do you think you're going to get to these, Miss Love? Tomorrow, Your Honor. <laughs> but, Your Honor, we, um, one portion of the Murphy interview where there's only Detective Dennis, Detective, I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Hudson and Mr. Murphy in the room, um, we, we don't want to put that portion in because Detective Gaither was not in the room. So that part, we can agree to. We've been, I think, pretty accommodating and reasonable as it relates to, um, you know, as, as it relates to requests for reaction, where we have pushed back into those areas where we believe it is um, perfectly admissible and not in any way uh, prejudicial that the information is being um, portrayed on the screen. So, um, you know, if the court, I would, I would like an opportunity to, after court ends today, to briefly address it with the court. I, I would gladly come in earlier. Of course, the court is aware. I requested that we come in at 8.30 every day and leave at 6.30. Um, I have no problem with that. I would like to get matters addressed before the jury is here. I don't mind how early we need to come in. I'll come in at 8, 7 30. But I feel that to have us um, I, to have us not able to properly address the concerns that we have with the reactions that have been demanded um, puts <coughs> puts everyone at a disadvantage when we are notified after we have comply with the court's instructions and after the information was not only served two years ago but two weeks ago there was a another notice of precisely the exhibits we intended to use and the first time we hear about these particular redaction requests is the day we're putting it up so it's a way that we are hamstrung we are not allowed to put up our case in a fluid manner so we would gladly come in as early as we need to and stay as late as we need to to hash these issues out. So I ask on the record again, like I did at the bench with Mr. Adams a few weeks ago before Mr. Weinstein ever filed his motion, right. that we be allowed to stay as late as need be and to come as early as need be to address these matters so that our cases aren't impacted negatively by any efforts of people that are different than we are. So I'm asking for that. I'm going to dismiss the jury for today. Sorry, Ingram. Summon our jurors, please. All right, thank, thank you, Sergeant Ingram. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All right, members of the jury, um, it's almost 5 o'clock today, and I think it might be a natural stopping point for you for today. Uh, so with your permission uh, and concurrence, I'm going to go ahead and recess you all um, for, the, for the evening.
Um, any minister in inquiry of me, ladies and gentlemen? Then, ladies and gentlemen, consistent with my earlier directives, what I'm going to do is I'll have you come in tomorrow morning for 8.30 for an anticipated 9 o'clock start time. Tomorrow is an abbreviated day. Um, as um, one of your... members has an appointment, so we're going to recess around 2, Okay to allow that individual to get to that appointment by three. So um, that's our goal tomorrow. So I may shorten a little bit of our, our lunchtime hour or work to accommodate that. We'll just have to see how things go, okay? But that's what I'm going to do with your permission and concurrence, all right? And then Friday, um, The 19th, we'll gather at 12.30 for an anticipated 1 o'clock start time, and then we'll go to around 5 or thereabouts, okay? All right. Um, unless you all have anything else, let's go through your admonitions at this point in time. Leave your notepads in the basket. Uh, please don't discuss anything you uh, that you've heard thus far in court. Don't, among, among, don't discuss amongst each other. Don't talk about it in onesies and twosies. Don't go home and share it with any of your friends, neighbors, and and uh, significant others. Please resist temptation of taking or viewing any third-party sites that may cover any other information in regards to this trial. Uh, <clears throat> and if anybody should, of course, um, third party or otherwise try and approach you in regards to this particular trial, uh, in any way, fashion, up, up close and personal, or through any means of of, uh, of communication or communication device, um, you need to let myself and Sergeant Ingram know immediately. Okay. Uh, remember, don't go by and visit any of the scenes that are depicted, or may you may have learned about. Uh, certainly, don't do any independent research because you can only consider what's been lawfully presented to you within the four walls of this courtroom. And remember, you're not to handicap or otherwise recap the testimony of any witness or anything you may have heard thus far, as that would be a violation of the admonitions as well. And you cannot consider this case until it's fully presented to you, and then I give you instructions on how you're to begin your deliberative process. Okay? So, and as lastly, as you know, thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience. Um, and patience you've given us up to this point in time and the patience that you continue to give us. So ladies and gentlemen, unless you have any other inquiry, I'll recess you all for the evening. We'll see you tomorrow morning for 8.30 and we'll get started sometime, sometime around eight, between 8.30 and 9 o'clock or thereabouts, okay? All right? All right. We're in recess. All rise. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated.
use that recording studio. So I'll plug you in there. And they include you on the email. If I thought it should be not if not, I don't know. I'm gonna make sure. One of the clues in this course is if it's more than so. Okay. Um, Let me cover a couple of things before we deal with um, Mr. Steele's motion limiting number 50, which Ms. Weaver's already been included on, and I will include as the next <coughs> court exhibit uh, in order the email as well as the um, um, motion. Here's the problem, as I keep telling you all, and I just try to say this as artfully as I can, but The challenge that we've been having thus far is that while you all are advocates and think that your position is one that you may be able to introduce evidence, if there is a disagreement, I have to take it up. The problem is that this evidence or information has existed in discovery for the longest period of time. And what irritates the court is that I have to keep stopping. It's not personal irritation or otherwise. It's just that I to I've told you many times before that this jury in the box, it, we should present and try and minimize disruptions. This, this afternoon, this morning, was an exercise in disruption. So if you don't want me to exclude your evidence, then I'll... The 4-1 judge, judge is a happy judge, means that you file something or you bring it to my attention way before the witness sits on the stand and I have to kind of go through edits and edits. So to that point, I mean, I can't make it any clearer. And you all are really trying to work yourselves into working on the weekend because that's the only way I'm gonna be able to get through this stuff is that I'm gonna have to excuse this jury and we're gonna work on a weekend to get this done. So be it. If that's what it takes, that's what it takes, but we're gonna, I can't keep stopping in front of this jury and taking up things that you all should have forecasted as a problem. What I mean by that, I'm gonna give representatives from the state of Georgia. Judge, we're gonna go ahead and introduce this PowerPoint or whatever, we have some concerns we brought them to the defense's issue, and here's, here's the things that we were not able to work out. Because remember, you all are seasoned advocates. This, ain't your, this is not your first trial. It's not like you don't know what you think is gonna be admissible or not. And if you're uncertain about it, that's why you file a motion of limity. The defense has done so on many occasions, but you all drive the kind of the, the, the train in this because if you don't, present it, then a lot of times they won't know that, that, they, that there's a problem. Or, as I mentioned earlier, the exhibit changes or you add additional things and they don't have the opportunity to take it up. That's why I'm telling you that it's a problematic issue. So that's what I mean by being forewarned. If you think, if you don't talk to your, talk to your uh, opposing side about this, that's where you're going to run into problems. Because I'm just going to start saying, well, if you haven't talked about it, if you haven't been, it hasn't been presented to me, and the jury's sitting in a box, I'm going to exclude it. At this point in time, I am very frustrated, to say the least. And I'm just telling you that being forewarned is more than just 10, say, you know, 10 minutes before we go out or, 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 or coming early or staying, or coming early or staying late. There are some 30 people that have to get in this particular spot in one time. And I can't blame you all, and I won't blame you all, because the law doesn't prevent me to do that, for not being in the proper place and space you're supposed to. 
And there are a lot of things that happen because all of us have been, uh, and the court is very sensitive, having been a trial advocate going from courthouse to courthouse, parking lot to parking lot, I understand what it takes to get in this courthouse in the morning. But you don't have to be here a lot earlier. And you need to be sitting in your places. We need to be waiting on them, shouldn't be waiting on you. There are at least six sets of lawyers that have to get here. And you all should not be just sitting down when I get when I get here. If I tell you to be here at a particular time, please be here on and 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 be in place so that I can go ahead and start. Because we eat up time that way. And um I, I mean I just don't know what else to tell you all, but I, I'm and, and I am Try, and I'm trying to be as patient as I can, but I'm at a loss for, loss for words at this point in time because I have said this over and over and over again. So if you don't want to see contempt, if you don't want to see us working on the weekends, then please change, your, change what you're doing. And Mr. Stark, the, the inquiry I made this morning is a valid inquiry. None of you would do this if you were in the United States District Court. None of you. My colleagues in federal court would probably jail most of you. I, and for those of you that have practice in federal court, this is not the way it goes. From the state's perspective, as well as the defense perspective, everything's filed in advance. So why should you do anything less than in this courtroom? I don't see the same level of professionalism and, and, and attentiveness that you, all, that, that you all need to do in terms of getting issues fleshed out. It's last minute. That's not fair to anybody. I got a rule on them. I, I, want, I really want to get it right uh, for everyone. I'm the gatekeeper. I have no interest in case other than see it's fairly tried. But... Things have got to change. That's why I asked that to you, Mr. Short, this morning. It wasn't for any other reason, because some of this stuff, I'm just at a loss for. You all are seasoned advocates. It should not make a difference whether or not somebody brought it up or who said what. If you know it's going to be an issue, flag it, present it, and, let's, and, and let me deal with it. Or let me carve out a day so I can go ahead and deal with it. I can't deal with this um, as a, as a witness on the stand. That's not right. So, that's why I asked you that this morning. So, in the interest of trying to kind of uh, get the right, please, please just modify your habits in terms of stop this last minute stuff. All right. Looking at um, motion in limine number 50, the redaction. All right, Mr. Steele, I have it. I marked it as the next court exhibit in order. So let's talk about it. So in paragraph number one, you were said this is the statements that were made on August 18th by Mr. Murphy. Correct. And you're saying it doesn't comply with my prior court order, all statements made by non-witnesses right. be redacted. So those were supposed to be redacted. All right, there's discussion you indicate regarding unrelated crimes that are not redacted. That's true too. So, and then the state redacted the exculpatory Brady evidence that Mr. Copeland, not a co killed Mr. Thomas, and this is not uh, speculation if it's co-conspirator hearsay. So let's just break that down. What about um, the unrelated crimes issue? Um, Your Honor, there is a conversation about other uh, armed robberies. I'm looking for the exact time that I can point you to. Uh, at a on the redacted version that we received this morning from the state, 
It should be at 11 minutes. It starts at 11 minutes. And again, it's Jacoby Hudson speaking. They talk about sex crimes. And then they talk about um, who shot somebody in the hip. Going to get life in prison. They carded Jack with federal agent. He has so many charges. Uh, Jacoby Hudson, the lawyer, asked he's if, if prosecuting that case. Okay, so and, and to me, that's from eleven to about about thirteen fifty six, right. right? Yeah. That's okay. Good. Is the state seeking to introduce any of that? What's the basis for its admission? Why do I need to hear it? I can read it and say, I can read it and tell you it's probably it probably doesn't have anything to do with what 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 we're what we're covering. Well, Your Honor, the court and, and, and counsel are aware our rules of evidence favor inclusion, and this is not inadmissible. There's nothing inadmissible about these about these portions that were brought to our attention, or else we would have flagged them. We actually agreed to take out things that were not. It, it's not relevant. How is how is somebody uh, about this conversation relevant for anything? What does the carjacking with federal agent have anything to do with it? As the court recalls, when we last time excluded a chunk of information and attempted to play portions that became relevant when a witness got on the stand, we were denied the opportunity to do so. That is why we are asking that the court not whole hog grant chunks of information be excluded without hearing the chunks of information and allowing the state the opportunity to point out the portions what we disagree we're not we're not going through what we went through this morning Ms. Love. i'm sorry i am sorry we're not doing that i excluded that because because look i have made my ruling on that particular issue so i'm not going back and talking about that I already ruled that we that we were going to exclude that particular portion. I ruled on it because we had argument on it. So, so your honor, the state just wants some guidance from the court. And the reason why we're asking for this guidance, your honor, is we have your administrative order that was filed. And what the state did, especially when we speak specifically about Dexter Montgomery, on April 4th, as the court instructed, we turned over all of our evidence to defense counsel that we, we were going to use everything that included all these recordings that we're talking about right now that included what you excluded the portion that you excluded earlier. We turned that over on April 4th. We received one motion in limine about redactions. That was what Mr. Shard filed on behalf of Mr. Stilwell on April 10th. Then we got another one this morning on April 17th. So what the court asked of the state to do, we did in order to avoid any late argument. What we understood from the court's administrative order is that state turn over the evidence so that defense counsel can review it. If there are any objections, they would file such. They did that for a portion of it. They never mentioned Mr. White's statement in this motion. They never mentioned any of the other redactions that are coming today. I got it. So, but let me ask you a question. Are those particular portions admissible? Which portion? For someone, Mr. White or for what we're talking about? What we're talking about right talking now. About? We have to go look at the earlier portion. What we have in the earlier portion of this statement, I believe it's the August 18th statement that we're referencing, is that in the room is Mr. Hudson, Investigator Dennis and Mr. Murphy, and they're talking prior to the um, interview starting. Some things are relevant, some things are not. We need to look at it and decide. But that's what you should have done already. But I mean, we just got the information, Your Honor. Okay, we didn't okay. know. All right. So the state believes that it should all come in. 
So if the defense has an objection, okay. then they have to let us know so we can talk about it. And we actually had some conversation this morning before we came to court to see what we can resolve. So we're trying to follow the court's instruction. I know that, but, so, but, I want, but I want you to go further. I want you to go further in the sense of you need to review your evidence before then and realistically kind of look at this in terms of whether or not it's going to be admissible. But Trump, I mean, because it, it's not like that's what I'm talking to you about. But, but Trump, they already filed a motion regarding this particular interview. View. And it didn't flag it, Your Honor. So the state is on notice about what they are. I, I, I understand that. And, but we, and they literally list out August 18, 2015. And then I think even Mr. Harvey had an additional redaction that we added to it. So we are following clearly the, what the court has asked. So this is what they objected to. This is what it is. If there was any objection earlier, they would have said that. So we would have then been able to argue it a week ago when we argued this motion. So this is, no, this is not a new interview. It's not old. This is the same August 18, 2015. It's the same. Interview. I know, but Mr. So they, they, they never Mr. notified us. And Mr. Steele is really good at notifying the state about objections. He did not. And so we didn't think it was an issue until he brought it to our attention. I understand. And we talked to him about it. We did not agree. And I think that is why Mr. Sharp brought it to the court's attention this morning about Mr. White, because we did try to resolve it. And I think he brought it to the court's attention because we could not resolve it and we wanted the court to make a ruling. And we were trying to find the time that the court was going to make the ruling in order for it to happen because we were following the instructions based on the administrative order. The order said, turn it over. We turned it over. They're going to launch whatever objections we have. If we can agree, we agree. If we can't, we bring it to the court's attention. I think that's what's been happening. So... This 11 to, to, three, to 1356, did you have it queued up at this point? <clears throat> I understand what you're saying. So you're saying that two defense counsels have differing opinions as to what should be redacted or included. That's a different portion. That's not even this portion right here. That's that's later on. And we redacted, based on this, what now another defense counsel wants in. But again, we were not put on notice so we can have that argument and hash that out. So we're trying to follow the court's instructions. We want to move this case along, and we're not trying to prolong it. But there are going to be times where the court, where the state and the defense are going to disagree. And we just want to make sure that we are properly following the court's instruction. And that's what we want to make sure. And so we just want guidance from the court. Try not to. Okay. I, I understand that. So just, just try not to do that like hours before I need to, I need to come because that should not be the, I'm what I'm feeling right now. That's more the, the rule than the exception. So and and I don't want to do, and the court doesn't want to do that anymore. So if this, so what, what, I, what I'm asking is if we disagree, if we talk about it and we disagree, should we then notify the court that we've discussed it and we still disagree and we think there needs to be a motion I mean, we need to have a hearing, excuse me. So I just want to make sure that the court, before coming into court, is fully aware. We've talked about it. We disagree. We, we may need a hearing so that the court is aware. So I just want to make sure we're following. The earlier, the earlier, the better, because then I decide whether or not the jury comes in that morning, how long we need to do it. Do we need to work the weekend? Do we need to, I mean, do we need, what time do we need to, to come and deal with it? But the more in advance I get a chance to look at it, like I said, and I, I believe that Ms. Love. But this is call. not this is not the way to do it. This is not the way to do it. And I think we tried to make calls earlier this week to defense counsel. Those calls may or may not have been returned, but I know that Mr. Still, Mr. Sharp was dealing with some things as well. So I, there could have been a variety of reasons why those calls were not returned. But we were making calls as well to get this resolved in advance. So we want we want the court to be fully aware. We're not trying to wait to the last minute. Trust me, we are not trying to delay anymore. We want to get this case moving along, but we want to make sure that we're following the court's instructions um, and not having evidence excluded after following the court's instructions. Do you have a flag, ma'am? We're, we're pulling it up. It has to play an evidence review, Your Honor. Mr. Steele? Okay. Just one. You know, everybody... Everybody should always be nothing but honest with each other in every dealing and profession. And, and I think that um, members of the state have
have done that and will continue to do that, and I know that the defense is trying to do that all the time. But I do want to raise one thing. When I received this today, the redaction today, that's what I filed, motion limiting number 50, you already ruled on motion limiting number 47, which I filed on 4924, and I specifically wrote in paragraph 2 that the state has indicated it will potentially use interviews and proffers of Mr. Walter Murphy, which is what we're talking about, as exhibits at trial in the above reference case. Then I wrote, Mr. Williams respectfully requests that, well, I wrote, without Attorney Hudson, excuse me, becoming a witness in this case, Mr. Williams respectfully requests that these portions and any other similar portions where non-testifying third parties make statements on the recording be redacted. This includes, I also wrote, any jail calls. The admission of any non-party, non-testifying third party at a proffer setting or meetings with the police violates Mr. Williams' constitutional rights and competition clause as well as the inadmissible hearsay declaration. You granted the state today, and I'm not casting aspersions, when they gave the redaction, I was surprised because all this that I have in there, except for the Brady and except for the Mr. Copeland shot, possibly shot the man, it's Mr. Hudson. You've already ruled it out. So for the state to say, and I'm not saying they're saying it wrong, maybe they forgot you ruled, but those are all the issues. Mr. Hudson and Detective Dennis, I know you haven't seen it, I guess they're friends. They get into a major discussion throughout this interview. That's what I flagged. So I wasted my time today to do what you already ordered because you want to have it in writing, and, you know, I'm trying. I understand that. That's it, and that's all that there is. So for the state to say they got it today or, you know, there's conflicting, it's not conflicting. Mr. Sharp, Mr. Harvey had issues. I had these issues. Yeah, I did rule upon that earlier state, so, I mean, in terms of the statements involving Mr. Hudson, so. Your Honor, I think the court should, I'd ask that the court respectfully look back. We carefully, Ms. Hilton was here that day. I was not, I believe, and, Your Honor, the court, Ms. Hilton took diligent notes about what was to be excluded. I believe that the resolution to what we disagree on would be sought in what the court said on the record. We took out the portions that the court ordered that we take out. Respectfully, Your Honor, I'm certain that there are areas where people can disagree, but I do know that we have been working very diligently to get those redactions done at her urging, as she was the one here listening to the court. So I'm not certain if there was a miscommunication, if one lawyer heard one thing and another heard something different. Perhaps the answer lies in the record itself, but we took out the portions we were ordered to take out, and as it relates to other matters, Judge, we do not have an agreement. We cannot agree on what we firmly, the court said that we should recognize things that might be a problem. We did, and we don't disagree on those. But the portions that are absolutely not impermissible, Your Honor, and that are only brought to us as a problem, you know, the night before the witness is to take the stand, we cannot read minds. You know, they're entitled to argue about anything, but we have tried. We have tried, and many times more Ms. Hilton than I, but we have seriously tried to be extremely accommodating and to anticipate problems. But when we can't, when we firmly disagree as to whether or not certain portions are permissible, not permissible, relevant, not relevant, that's the place where we have to come to Your Honor, and respectfully, Your Honor, that's what happened today. We were blindsided, and with the way that if defense counsel is allowed simply to make an objection, and we didn't come up with whatever thing they found in some way could be possibly in another universe inadmissible, then the court has told the state that this court will exclude the state's evidence because they came up at 946 p.m. the night before after having this stuff for two weeks, and after hearing cross-examination of D'Angelo White, Your Honor, where Mr. Atkins specifically confronted Mr. White with the very statements they are now asking not to be included. The very statements. He literally verbatim asked Mr. White with over no objection from either of the defense these exact statements, and now they want to keep them out 
Because then it looks like he was arguing something or assuming facts, not in evidence, when in fact, he was simply confronting the witness with a prior inconsistent statement, as he was supposed to do. So at 946, we did a motion in limine to exclude it, and they had this for two weeks knowing we were going to do exactly that. After Mr. Wright took the stand, they knew we were going to do exactly this. So we literally have been talking to them. I've called and said, talk to me. Call me. Here, I've been told on the record, we don't want to talk to her. Literally, that's what was said on the record. We don't need to talk to her. And so, Your Honor, I'm begging the court not to hamstring the state and leave it in the... I'm not trying to hamstring you, madam, but I want you, but I want you all to be prepared. We it's are, ridiculous. And we have been. And we literally told them last night, we are sending over this final but I am, reaction. But I do not. And then we get this whole list of things. I mean, it is it is very, it's disruptive. You know, we get it at 9.46 at night, and, and it's, it's, it's not fair to anybody, frankly. The defense, the state, the jury, the court, it's not fair to anybody. Well, stop doing it then. I mean, that's the but, problem. Uh, that's the thing. Stop time. doing it. And we have anticipated a lot, but the things to anticipate, and to, well, <laughs> to anticipate, Your Honor, not. Madam, I, I'm, yes, I'm kind of just, I'm tired, okay? So I really am. I really am. Mr. Sharp. I'm trying not to belittle the point, but um, we, we at at this point we have filed motions, and I have been filing motions the day before, and and Your Honor has has said certain things to me, and I accept that, and I'm not complaining to the court, but the things that I've filed in those motions are legal arguments that I never thought I would have to make because I did not think the state would ever try to admit such evidence. Because we have all gone to law school, we all know what hearsay is, we all know what inadmissible evidence is, we all know what irrelevant evidence is, we all know that we wouldn't play recordings that talk about unrelated crimes, wholly unrelated crimes. We all know that we wouldn't play recordings where people say what other people said. So that's, respectfully, Your Honor, and, and maybe I haven't articulated, that's why I haven't filed these motions. But when, when, I see, when I see the state put in their anticipated evidence coming forward through Investigator Dennis, a PowerPoint presentation that is just full of hearsay and full of incomplete, irrelevant, extraneous information, then I, I actually was put on notice at that time. I, I said, the state really thinks there's no rules to this. So I really need to start flagging everything. I was not trying to be disrespectful to the court by waiting to the last minute. I didn't think it was necessary to say, I want the state to follow the rules of evidence in the presentation of this case. I am now on notice, and I will be flagging everything I can think of and, and try to have a happy judge because it will be a for, you will be a forewarned judge. But I want you to understand that that's where I'm coming from. I understand. And, and so a lot of these things, I just didn't think we'd need to argue about. All right. Let me hear the statement, uh, the, 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 vid, the, the audio uh, from 11 to 1356. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't mean nothing. You said a hundred and how many? It, you talking about this David? You know David? Okay, I mean, right in the door with me, bro. She's done. Oh, she's done. She's done. Full of the TV. Full of the TV. Full of the TV. Yeah, because he, you want to know what? Because he's going to be there for a little bit. Yeah, he's going to be there for a little bit. What? 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 That is, he brought, we're going to tell the place. He like, he ain't like, come on, we're going to rock on that too. Yeah, we're going to keep it like this. I don't think it's going to rock on that. He got the color behind him. He's trying to find him. He's still in his slim, skinny, tall. Yeah, he got shot in the hip by the homo. Yeah? 
I think you played till almost 1600, something like that. We played till six. I, it, it looks to be 1607. Okay. Um, and Judge, the point up until where um, you hear Mr. Huff, you're not because the court is open for one moment. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am.
can play this song, playing it like it's supposed to be played in the media reviewer, in the evidence reviewer. And um, I sincerely apologize to the court for taking up more time than I should be. <coughs> section you're playing me now because I wanted to hear 11 through 1356 I heard it already even though what was it what was it you were going to tell because I heard that I, I heard it through 1607 okay. and that's what you told me so the part that we were saying we had no problem up to was the point and we were trying to find the time stamp where he said I told you where uh, Mr. Hudson is imploring Mr. Murphy to think about his son and um that if that means he can see his son and talk to them folks, all right? So when Mr. Hudson is encouraging Mr. Murphy to be candid, that portion, up until that portion, we have no problem with. But given the cross-examination and the questions that have been asked and the answers that were given on the stand, we believe it is very important that the jury hears, because Mr. Murphy uh, said many times, and of course aware, he would have done anything. Well, the jury should hear what Mr. Murphy heard and how, uh, what his reaction was, because that's what we're asking for it to be admitted for, what, mis what the effect of the words of the people around him had on Mr. Murphy, because the argument has been made already and will be made throughout this case. Mr. Ho Mr. Sharp's whole opening was about Luke's general something or another, Luke Fulton County. And so the argument is being made that people are attempting to lie their way out of having to spend more time in jail. When you have a piece of evidence where a person whom a witness trusts is not threatening him, is the, and no one in the room is threatening him, but he is being provided a nurturing kind of environment and being encouraged to just be honest and think about his children, the state believes that it is a very important part of this witness's prior inconsistent statement that the jury should hear. The jury should hear the effect of Mr. Hudson's words on his client at that moment. We have both detectives in the room. It's not a hearsay issue. We're not offering Mr. Hudson's statement for the truth of the matter asserted. We're offering them for their effect on Mr. Murphy, who has now come in and said something way different than what he said during his interview. So, Your Honor, up until this point right here, up until the point where um, uh, where he says to, where Mr. Hudson tells Mr. Murphy, you need to think about Blake, the state has no problem with it because it doesn't, it, it doesn't deal with him and this negotiation that he is engaging in. They're just having small talk. We are perfectly amenable to taking out up until that point, and we will get that correct time stamp for the court and make certain that we have that to the court. Um, I don't want to play it again because everyone is tired, but I would like for the court to at least understand that we are not we are not asking um, for to include everything that they want out. We are just saying that relevant portions, and of course, 
Number one, the bar for relevancy is low. But number two, we're not putting in, we're not trying to get in hearsay. This is this is things that were told. Okay, but what is what is it? Okay, assuming Mr. Steele's um, time hacks are correct. At eleven hundred hours, eleven hundred. Somebody stops by and says hello. Hudson knows and speaks about sex crimes to about eleven fifteen, about first fifteen seconds. All right. So, what does that have anything to do with with this case? If that's at the very beginning, I don't mind that being out, but we can't. The problem with giving a generalized description of something that's being said is that we could end up having excluded important parts that we don't agree to and that are relevant and not inadmissible. So that's why we are asking the court not to rely on generalized description of a segment of a witness's interview. Do you have a transcript of this particular hearing? I mean, yes, I we, we haven't had any time to correct it, but we do have a transcript and we're looking at it and we can provide it to everybody in the court to make things easier. We're sending it out now. We have not had an opportunity to make sure that it's a <coughs> reflection of all that is said, but we will send it anyway. <coughs> Let me ask y'all, so, um, well, that needs to be corrected, but... Um, so, <coughs> well, the question is that? Well, here's the challenge. The challenge is that you need to, or it seems like you need to have a, a transcription of the tape so you can kind of figure out well, what was said so that you can get the exact time marks. So, an agreement. And you don't have that. And that hasn't been sent out. Can we take up other? Can we take up some other witnesses or hear some other testimony while that is being while that is being done? Well, it's already been done. But you mean the transcript? Which thing yes, you because the transcript. I mean, because it seems like to me, I'm not going to be able to kind of rule upon this until you all have the exact time relative time time or what is said, so you all can kind of say, okay, listen, we want to chop out from here to here. We agree. Here to here, we don't. He, and I can kind of then look at it from that perspective. Your Honor, if I may request something in the court, um, since we have a we have had an opportunity to check it for corrections, but since we have a transcript that we can provide to the court and to counsel for the defendants, will the court require the parties to identify the portions, the segments? With the appropriate times that they come up, the specific lines in this 161 page transcript that they are asking to be taken out. Since they have already contacted, they should be easily able to find the portions in the transcript, even if the words are not always exactly correct, and at least give the state, you know, some hours, so at least by 10 o'clock tonight, provide to us what specific well, my portions they want. <laughs> My, su my suggestion is you take that transcript and then the two of you, the both sides sit in here and you figure out exactly what you want to line out and what needs to be what I need to rule upon. Because it sounds like you probably have some things that would probably be not in disagreement. There'll be a limited universe of stuff I got to kind of, I got to kind of consider, but I, this is not fruitful. This is not a fruitful exercise. It's just not. So, um, you know, what, what we can um, do, we'll do exactly. Well, that's my suggestion. I mean, because because when we're asking that um, the court allow us to report a little bit earlier than than the court had originally planned, so that if we don't hash it out right now, we can have the court make that decision before the jury even ever gets in the building. And your honor, um, I I can I can um, what I can do is for the sake of moving things along. I can play portions um, beyond anything that we can't agree on. I can 
and um, putting portions of it with the understanding that after the court makes the decision, uh, we are either going to be allowed to go back and play that portion or we'll just keep moving on without it. But I, this, this is something that can be dealt with between now and the time that our first witness is to report tomorrow. This is one interview that <laughs> will not stop the show. We can, we can do what we need to do and we can stay and we can go over this and we can report as early as the court asks us to. And we can send a report of our ability to work through it to the court this evening so the court is on notice as to what we were able to agree on and not. And we may even come up with a solution that's acceptable for everybody. I don't know. But we're willing to stay until it's done. Mr. Sharp, you know, I saw you just rise. Your Honor, um, two things. Uh, we have already identified those portions, but the other larger issue that I... I don't think you've identified them with... with they don't match. I, I mean, because theoretically, what what you have and what Mr. Steele has and what the state has should all should all be in the same. Like the first one I heard, I didn't I didn't hear all the the words. The second one I heard, I heard all the words. But, but the the larger issue, Your Honor, um, and and I'm just speaking from my experience. Generally, when we've been dealing with prior inconsistent statements, in my experience. It hasn't been someone said something that the state feels is inconsistent, so they just put in a tape. It's focused. You, if 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 uh, Walter Murphy said the sky was blue, and then on the stand he said it was red, but he said it was blue to Investigator Gaither. Investigator Gaither, when you spoke to Walter Murphy on January first, two thousand twenty-three, didn't he say the sky was blue? And then. That's how they get in the prior inconsistent statement. I don't really understand why we're playing just these lengthy tapes to impeach people because it's not focused on the inconsistent statements. And that's why we're getting in Jacoby Hudson giving, you know, friend talk between Jacoby Hudson and Investigator Dennis and all these other extraneous things because we're not focusing on the discrepancies. And to me, well, that's what prior inconsistency. Okay, means. that's one thing. But the state says that they affect the effect on listeners. So, what's your what's your what's your take on that? That is irrelevant. That is uh, not proper to be playing tapes of Jacoby Hudson, who's a witness in this case, but he's speaking. Not a witness. <laughs> he's not. Yeah, he, he's not a witness. That's what I'm saying. He's not a witness, and so I don't know why we would be playing tapes of him talking to anyone. For context, Your Honor. And we also well, I understand that the state wants to, but... I agree, but his lawyer his lawyer's statements, Mr. Hudson's statements aren't relevant. They're not. Your Honor, him and Kirk, because this, this is how this has gone so far, what the questions have been to these uncooperative witnesses have been... Did they tell you that you could get out of jail? Did they tell you this? So somehow or another, it's okay that they make an issue out of what the prosecution said, and then we're not allowed to meet that with what he was told by his attorney in the presence of others, so it's not protected or privileged. It is absolutely relevant, Your Honor. It's not, you know, relevance is obvious. I, I, I get, I get, I get, I get that, but the what, but, it, but it's very defined and targeted. Him talking... Mr. Hudson talking about, you know, uh, the sex crimes or shooting, shooting or whatever. Um, that's not relevant. That's not relevant. That's not relevant. And the court said exactly right. There are portions that we actually don't have a problem with excluding. We agree with the ground open. Okay. We will take that out. But there's other portions that the court said we don't have a problem with
circumstances, Mr. Murphy made these statements under and who was doing what and he was being threatened with jail time unless he talked because that's the image that they're giving. And they are asking the court to exclude the state's relevant portions of these interviews with Mr. Murphy and the detectives in this case with his trusted friend, if the court remembers, on cross, Mr. Hudson, uh, Mr. Murphy was asked about, on cross, asked about his relationship with his lawyer. And on cross, he was asked about whether or not Mr. Hudson paid his bond. So if they're going to be able to bring up things like whether Mr. Hudson paid his bond and how close Mr. Hudson was to, um, to Mr. Murphy, then the state should be allowed to introduce portions where Mr. Hudson is encouraging Mr. Murphy to just be honest. And he is I, don't have, I, I don't have any issue with that specific. But the other, these other conversations and then talking about uh, other crimes, about improper statements about other people. Uh, but they, but they, but they need to be, they need to be excised. They're not relevant. We, we They're not relevant. We, we agree to take out everything up to that point. That's what we're saying. This is not something that's, you know, this isn't even the hard one. We agree to take out everything up to think about Blake. And if there are portions after that that they feel strongly about, and they want us to reconsider and look at, then allow us the opportunity to do that. But they're not wanting to do that. They're trying to argue the issue about whether or not this, the recording is even permissibly played before the jury. And that's just the effort to try and get the court, I guess, to bring the court down and have it all taken out. But Your Honor, we're just trying to get in. We're trying to talk. We, uh, we've been doing it all along, and we're not going to stop. We're trying to um, come to some agreement as to what can be done. All right. Ms. Adams? Let me just say this. On the lines, She doesn't appear to really know. Is that it was Miss Hilton who asked the witness about his relationship with Jacoby Hudson? It was Miss Hilton who asked whether or not did he pay your bond. Now, nothing in what Mr. Murphy said. He never said, I said what I said, or I did what I did, or I gave this statement because of something that Jacoby Hudson said to me. So, there's, so just because they want to try and infer that that was part of it doesn't mean their strategy becomes evidence. There's nothing relevant about what Mr. What Mr. Hudson is saying to Mr. Murphy. It doesn't become relevant simply because they want to use it. And then if, now, if Mr. Mr. Murphy in his testimony had said, you know what, I would have done anything to get out of jail, or, you know, what my lawyer said to me, you know, had some effect on me, then yeah, they could impeach him with that. But he never said that. And he any, didn't and, say and, that. Can I finish, please? Hold on. Let me finish. Question, any question about his relationship to Mr. Hudson and how close they are, Hey, not us. It came from them. Okay. So, y'all, he literally said that. I would have chopped off my arm. He said he, he did. Intro. He said that. He said it throughout. Every chance we asked him a question, every time we asked him about this interview, Ms. Hilton confronted him with the statements during the interview. I don't remember what I said, but I was high every day for a whole year, and, and I would say anything. I would say anything. couple of statements from Mr. Mr. Hudson, which I agree with Mr. Mr. Adams may be marginally relevant in terms of what was in terms of what was said, but I think that he's already been kind of examined on that issue. So but he never told the truth about it. He, he continued to be untrue. But that's like what the ju the jury's going to decide. That. The, ju the jury is going to decide that particular issue. But you, I'm telling you, you get into more problems. You get into more problems. Offering this particular state, you just do. And God, we have to, we have to give them the prior inconsistent statement for them to make the decision. Otherwise, all they've heard is him saying, "I don't remember," and I would have told anything to cut off. 
Okay, but I, I, I understand that, and that's a that's that's a disagreement, but with that Ms. you and Mr. Adams have, and Ms. Hilton has, but all this other stuff not relevant. It's not the <laughs> conversations with Mr. Conversations with Mr. with Mr. Uh, Mr. Hudson are not relevant. They're not. So I I mean. And his transcript's 100, I mean. The portion that they're asking to be taken out, I believe, in on page. Um, what page? I believe it begins on page 30, I think. I'll have to listen to the general time. So it's not sure, but I think it's page, page 30 of one, oh, 161. The interview of Walter Murphy? Yes, I think that's what they're asking for. The August 18th, 2015 interview? Yes, I think that that's what they're asking for. Up to um, the point where the investigator Baylor says, well, where the I mean, especially, and, uh, I'm looking at page 30 of 161 counties, which I'll include as the next court exhibit in order of the August 18th, uh, 2015 interview. Are you influenced, are you under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, medications, or anything like that? Mr. Murphy, I uh, know. So yeah, that would be admissible yeah, because he testified, I was high. So, right. yeah, okay, yeah. all right. And even at line 13, where he says, all right, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. I, I got it, I got it, I got it. Your Honor? Yes. August the 18th, 2015. You it, said page 30? 30 of 161. The, the, the state just sent us something. There's oh, three. Now it's, now it's popular. Yeah, it, it, it takes a while to populate, okay. but it should, it should be pages 30 of 161 once it's fully paginated. So, so what they're willing to do is they're willing, the state is willing to take out one through twenty pages one through twenty nine, up through page up through line three of page thirty, and start at line four. I advise the right. Um, councils, my suggestion would be you go through the transcript. Transcripts. Um, 
flag the exact language that you are uh, that you can agree upon, and or actually flag the I'm sorry, flag the um, the the statements that you that you are in opposition that you can't reach agreement. I will I can rule upon those, but it doesn't sound like the um, that's that's that would be the best way that I think the court could probably.